We have basic RFID tag cloning in antique camera photography with Gabe Schuyler. Hi, Gabe. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, let me share my slides and uh, let's talk about some new tech and some old tech and uh, let's let's get into some trouble here. Um, okay, so my talk is about RFID tag cloning and anti-camera photography. Um, I'm calling this a two-step dance on the electromagnetic spectrum because they are both on the electromagnetic spectrum. I'll get into that in a second. Here's me, Gabe Schuyler. I've uh, been in ops forever. I've uh, been in DevOps. I worked at Puppet Labs for seven years. Um, and then most recently, kind of into InfoSec, but I'm a constant tinkerer. So I've always been uh, messing around with stuff, whether it was RFID tags or anti cameras. Just always really curious. Uh, so join me with the curiosity here. Uh, here's why I call it a two step is because first I'm going to talk about radio that's on this end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and then we're going to talk about light. So they are actually the same darn things. They're just on different ends of the spectrum. All right, let's start out with RFID. That's just short for radio frequency identification. Uh, these are things used for access control, uh, personal ID, uh, like your, your ID for, for an office when we used to have those, uh, payment cards, um, things like a, a transit card will we'll frequently use radio frequency identification. Um, and these are passive RFID formats, which means they don't, they don't even need a battery or anything. Come in all sorts of form factors. Uh, the one you're looking at right here is actually the impetus for me getting into RFID at all, uh, which was that I, I ride, um, but my building's garage door needs an RFID tag to actually get in. But as, as you can sort of tell from this, uh, trying to fumble for the RFID tag with gloves on on a vehicle that requires both hands to actually, you know, manage um, was a little tricky. So I decided, you know what? I've heard that these are so easy to copy. I've probably boasted that these are so easy to copy uh, to friends. Um, so let's put my money where my mouth is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start copying some RFID tags. Let's uh, let's start out with how they how they work in the first place. Um, this will be passive RFID. Uh, that's an interesting thing uh, because that means that your, your your tag or your card or your, your key fob doesn't have a power source to itself. Um, and so the, the comparison that people will make is is to a flashlight or, or a lighthouse, um, something that you can you can pulse at a normal rate, but you could also like spell out in Morse code or binary of some sort a message. Um, and then someone with a mirror. So if I wanted to talk to you, I've got a flashlight, but you don't, you can imagine a situation where I could blink my light, I could do, you know, send a binary message. But then if I were then to say, okay, your turn, and just send an even pulse, you could use the mirror to reflect or not reflect that pulse selectively, and you could actually tell me a message back. A vast oversimplification, um, but that's the idea here: is that that the the reader has the blinking light, um, and then the card could borrow that energy to actually make a message go back as well. Uh, your your RFID tags are are um, are going to go at a certain frequency. That's just the speed that the the lighthouse is spinning at. Um, and the two most common that you're going to see for things like access technologies um, are 125 kilohertz and 13.56 megahertz. Uh, you'll probably just want to do some research to figure out which ones yours are. Um, all this stuff is pretty, pretty public. Um, but if you want to look cool, there are actually easy ways to detect since, after all, the reader is the flashlight and it's sending out energy. All you really need in, in the case of what I'm showing here is a card with an LED that can pick up that energy and just channel it into an LED. So what you're seeing here is, is actually the reader on the garage door that I've got. Uh, and I'm just holding up something that, that's the same exact format as a, a credit card. And it's telling me that uh, this one uses low frequency. So super easy to just figure it out on your own if you want. Um, also, you kind of feel like a spy. So that's the flashlight. 
how does the mirror work? Somebody's got to flash that light back. It's got to read things. It's got to, to answer to them. And that's what's called a chip set. Um, if you look in here, I've got a whole bunch of form factors that I'm looking at. But here inside this one is a loop. That's a coil. It's an antenna. Then there's a teeny little chip. In. So it's taking in the pulses and then doing some processing and answering. Um, you'll find that that uh, access keys are, are generally pretty simple um, unless somebody's invested a whole bunch, um, but I'm, my apartment building, you know, they, they're a little cheap. Uh, and what I've been finding, and don't quote me, I'm just a tinkerer, uh, is that the lower frequency ones tend to be simpler. Here are just a few examples of the chips. Uh, they're not encrypted. They're, they're really just identifying themselves with a number uh, and the reader is trusting that. Uh, whereas from the ones I've found, the higher frequency ones are a little fancier. They may have encryption. Uh, they can be written to. Um, it's just, just the trend I've seen there. So mine's a low frequency. And I can just get right into solving the problem. So what I thought to myself was, well, how far can I get if I go onto eBay? Um, I've looked up my key. I know that it uses the uh, TM5577 chipset. Uh, it's a low frequency. Why don't I just go on eBay and find something? And I did. Um, and this is a perfectly acceptable answer. I know we're all hackers and, 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 and uh, orienting this towards people who are learning stuff. We all want to learn stuff, but sometimes you just need to get the job done. Um, don't worry. I'm going to get more exciting. But on eBay, 10 bucks, this thing's cheap. It just works. Uh, it's chipset specific, so I had to know my chipset, my frequency, but it works. If all you need to do is copy a couple of these things, whoop do do It even comes with spares, uh, spare uh, key fobs for you. Um, these also are kind of notorious for uh, playing some shenanigans. Um, once I started to get into the more advanced stuff and actually looking at the data on the cards, um, I realized that this little thing uh, sets a password on the, the key fob, and some of them will actually set it uh, read-only. So you can only ever use this thing once, unless you know what password the manufacturer used uh, to sort of give you this, this rudimentary uh, vendor lock-in. So if you just need to copy things, who cares? Uh, but if you really want to play around, um, spend a couple bucks more or borrow from somebody, uh, one of these guys. This is the Proxmark 3. Um, pretty much the only thing I found that really just makes things easy. Uh, usually I would be vendor neutral. Um, I am vendor neutral, but this vendor um, or this design is really great. It is open source. So somewhat vendor agnostic in that sense that you can get them from a bunch of different places uh, with either the firmware already built in there or not. Some assembly will be required to kind of get your setup working. Uh, you'll be connecting to it with a, a USB modem interface sometimes, uh, but it really does do it all. Uh, what you're looking at is this red coil is an antenna uh, for the low frequency. There's also an antenna for the high frequency, um, and it really can just read pretty much anything, write pretty much anything. Uh, if a card's encrypted, you're going to have to do a little more work. Um, but for something like my building lock, uh, it's actually just so so rudimentary that it's, it just works. So what I did was I read my card. And this is my key on the low frequency antenna. And I'm reading it. Here's a readout of what's going on in the software. No, that's not my actual number. Uh, but what you're looking at here is a facility code, which is basically building number, if you can think of it that way, and then card number which is really more to identify you. Um, and actually with a five digit number here, you can actually imagine this as the pinnings of a key, um, that, that these are the, the settings for it. So just like a hardware key, just like a normal key that you would have, metal key, um, we also have a static identity right here that you can copy. Uh, it's, it's really quite simple. And then, you just write it. So I did my research. Um, also, when I read 
I could see what type of chip I was using and then just to write it. Very simple. Just told the Proxmark 3 to write it. And here's me writing my facility code uh, and my card number. And then I'm also telling it how to encode this uh, because it said it's a hid card with that encoding. Tons of form factors. Uh, and I think when I started out, this really was what I was going for was that key that I had, the blue one that you see over on the right side is pretty bulky. Um, and I've copied a few of these for my friends as well. And there are reasons that you want to have a different form factor, same frequencies and chipsets um, in the key fobs and cards. Uh, and in my key, you can also get injectable chips. Um, this is actually what veterinarians use when they chip your, your, uh, your dogs or your cats or your whatever, uh, is they're actually just using an RFID tag that's small enough to be injected. Um, you can also do this to humans, uh, but I was not in the mood for that. Um, to be honest though, actually, I was gonna, I was gonna purchase one of the injectable ones because they're small, uh, and then try to sew it onto my glove, something like that, um, but, which is interesting because incidentally, Wookie is doing leather working <laughs> on track two right now. So we've got something in common on our talks, um, but ended up working for me was that you can actually get a ring for your finger. Um, actually, I've got it on right now. That has that that uh, chipset and the antenna in it. Uh, antenna is a loop after all. So very simple to embed that into a ceramic ring. So my problem of I have this key, I have gloves, it's all really annoying is that now I just put on this ring when I go out riding. And when I get back, I just wave my hand at the reader and the garage door opens. So that was my solution to my situation. And here's my encouragement to you uh, is to have fun with this as well. Um, all you really have to do is a little bit of research to figure out which chipset and which frequency you're looking at. Um, it's okay to go the cheap route. I don't think anybody's gonna judge you. In fact, um, your friends who don't know about RFID are probably gonna be amazed that you pulled out this little blue thing and copied their key for them. The fancy stuff is fun. I, I will admit that um, leads to some interesting rabbit holes. Uh, my key is similar to probably three quarters of my friends' keys, uh, which is that it's a very simple chip with just the uh, facility code and the card number, super easy to copy. However, the other quarter of my friends have uh, typically their high frequency, but interesting cards that actually have encryption or that write a value to the card every time it's used. Um, so those are fun, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be copying them anytime soon, probably. Um, and it, it it really is fun. I, I did add Amaze Your Friends, uh, Mystify Your Enemies here because it really is a lot of fun uh, to show people how this stuff works. Uh, I think it's it's similar to the first lockpick village that you go to uh, where you realize that the, the internal workings of this thing that's supposed to be trustable um, are not as fancy as you thought. Uh, it, it, just because it's a computer and you can't see inside it doesn't mean you can't figure out what's inside it and do something to it. Um, so really do encourage you to, to play with this stuff um, if, you've got, if you've got the, uh, the chance to, uh, but hopefully at least you have an understanding now that the, uh, the technology isn't all that tricky and that when you say to your friends, oh yeah, those things are so easy to copy, they actually are. Um, and, and you can kind of back that up a little bit and say, yeah, there was, there was this dude showed us motorcycle thing with the, the reins. Let's flip this flapjack. All right. RFID is fun. Let's get to the other end of the spectrum, uh, which is going to be antique cameras. Um, the impetus for this one uh, is really interesting. I just, um, I was at a, a swap meet and 
saw a antique camera and did one of 10 bucks for it. Um, he, he was willing to accept five bucks for it. Uh, the thing was pretty dirty and grimy, but I figured, you know, it looked nice. Um, it was a while ago, but these days it would be, you know, in my Zoom room. That would have been when I bought it. Um, and then once I got home with it, I realized that this little $5 piece of junk actually still works. Uh, and so it sort of sent me on a, a trip to the other end of the, uh, the EM spectrum here uh, and a different time as well. So all the way back to uh, the early 1900s, um, looking at these things. And it's really not that hard to do. So to give the same treatment uh, as the RFID, how does it work? Um, I, I grew up with film cameras. I know a lot of people didn't, uh, especially if you're a student right now. Um, so let me just give you this super oversimplified view, just like with RFID, uh, which is that um, we're, all we're doing is we're taking visible light in to a box. The light going into the box goes through a lens so that it creates an image on the back of the box. And then we have film in there. Um, and film, I think the easiest way to describe how film works is it's similar to getting a sunburn. Um, is that if there's something that's photosensitive on the back here, and that's the film, or if there's something like you know your arm that's photosensitive, um, and you apply different amounts of light to it, it's going to actually store that image. So if you imagine you know, writing things in sunscreen on your arm or, or scraping it off, uh, maybe signing your name on your arm, and then you go out and you get sunburned, the places that get more light uh, because they didn't have as much sunscreen are gonna be darker. And the places that uh, didn't get a lot of light are gonna be light. That's really all that's going on with film. Uh, it's really nothing all that fancy. It's just here's something out here that I see, light comes in, it's something that's photosensitive. And then later I use chemicals to just fix that at the spot it is right there. So super simple. That's why a $5 piece of junk actually still works. Uh, before you get into antique cameras um, or junky cameras, I guess in my case, um, you will need to accept that uh, chaos is, is going to happen. Um, film is sensitive to light, you're gonna fumble it and drop it. Uh, you're gonna try to change the film around in total darkness so it doesn't get an image, uh, it's not gonna work. Um, old cameras leak light into them. So you're not just getting the image that's out there, you're getting like the crack in this side of it, uh, especially the old ones. Um, the, they, <laughs> they are not um, automatically adjusting for the amount of light that's coming in, you're gonna have to do a lot of guesses. Uh, so you're gonna end up with photos that are completely blown out because uh, too much light came in. Um, film has to be wound between shots, you're gonna forget. Uh, in the upper right here is a double exposure because I took two photos at the same piece of, of film. Uh, my $5 camera was certainly full of mold. Um, but really to, to, to uh, invoke Bob Ross, um, you don't get into this stuff because you're afraid of mistakes. Uh, th there aren't mistakes that are happy accidents. Um, and I picked sort of some representative photos here of uh, blown out bamboo. Oh, that's kind of cool, high contrast. Uh, mold in the lower left here. I don't know, kind of looks cool. Uh, blurry things, double exposures. Uh, these are all gonna be part of it. Uh, and and I think one of the one of the fun things about these uh, happy accidents, so to speak, um, is that you're going to get people on whatever social media feed you have um, asking you how the heck you did that and what filter you used. Um, and the answer is I, I really just used a whole bunch of mildew. Let's talk about some of these devices that you can get for five bucks. This is the Pocket Kodak. Um, this is really one of the first attempts to democratize photography, uh, to make a camera that could be used with a pretty simple film and with a pretty simple mechanism. Uh, it is collapsible. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the bellows. So it actually collapses down to a pretty small size. Um, I would not 
try to fit it into most pockets. A jacket pocket probably work. Uh, certainly not fashionable pair of jeans. Collapsible, so easy to take around. Has a little kickstand on it. Um, older cameras and older film take a while to actually burn in that image. So you need to hold them still. So this is designed for a normal person to just stand it up. It's facing straight forward then and then use the shutter without having to actually hold it still. Uh, you will get to use your Dremel on some of these. Uh, the more you do, the more, more wonderful uh, chances you're gonna have to justify buying a really nice Dremel. Uh, sometimes spools of film don't exist anymore. You have to take one that does exist, and shave off pieces of it. Uh, you, you, can have, you can have a lot of fun. Um, don't be afraid to break these. The, they are democratized. They are built uh, for people to, to mess with them. These are the sorts of photos that I got out of this guy. Um, also, dozens of photos that didn't look uh, <laughs> like this. Um, blown out, uh, things where it was in my pocket, but it was really bright sunlight outside, leaks came in. Um, but I did end up with, with some fun ones. Um, and again, this is this is kind of where your friends say, "Hey, hey, what filter did you use? That's that's kind of cool. Like that looks sort of like creepy and old." Uh, let me go back here, and the pocket Kodak was 1900s to the 30s. There was a span where Kodak made the vest pocket, and this was from the 10s to the 20s through the 20s. This was specifically built um, to be quote the soldier's camera. It's nice and small. Um, it's uh, actually around the size of a smartphone, maybe the Max version, but still. Um, and there are a ton of these. Uh, they are cheap when there's not a bidding bubble going on on eBay. They're cheap at a flea market. They should be at most 20 bucks. Um, they didn't age all that well. So you are going to want like some gaffer's tape to tape over anything where you think light might be leaking in. Um, it won't be a perfect job. <laughs> so, so again, get ready for those happy accidents. And here's the results of that. Uh, this one was actually in pretty good shape. So it was able to take a pretty clear image here of my friend Jessica. Uh, and this was actually indoors. Uh, she looks slightly bemused because the film takes a while to expose. So she actually had to sit still there. Uh, so this was like five seconds of her being like, okay, Gabe, all right, fine. Uh, got an outdoor picture here. Uh, these these white spots, this is where light was leaking in, where my gaffer's tape was not quite doing the job. Uh, and then here's a fun one. These cameras were designed with black and white film in mind. Uh, so they made choices about the lenses uh, and they made choices about where the film was going to go through informed only by the idea that they were going to be doing black and white um which i guess is that sunburn as well is you know red or or, or red or not um i guess tan i don't know uh and so putting color film in it really gave me this really weird effect uh, don't be afraid to just go and e experiment with these if the film fits try it in the camera it might come out looking really weird it might be you know a million dollar iPhone background that love forever. Here's actually the one that I got at the swap meet. Uh, this is the Brownie Hawkeye, fifties to the sixties. Um, and odds are, if you see, you know, goofy picture of your grandparents from the fifties, it was shot on one of these. Um, this was this was truly an effort to democratize photography, or at least you know, portraits and family things. Uh, with a, a mass market um, sold everywhere, uh, point and shoot. You can't adjust the shutter speed. You can't adjust how wide the lens is. You have no choice <laughs> about any of this. Um, but that means they are virtually indestructible because there's just not a lot of moving parts on them. They're made out of Bakelite. It's a thick piece of Bakelite. Um, like you could run, run this thing over with a car. Uh, and totally cheap um i got i got the camera dude to give it to me for five bucks uh, just totally cheap uh, and really wonderful uh 
I really enjoy them. They all end up taking photos similar to this. Um, and they're all kind of square photos, which is, which is really, like it really gives it that, that, that antique feel to the photo itself. Um, I was shooting in broad daylight here on the left, um, actually in the shade. Uh, this one in the middle, this is full daylight. Uh, I don't even know why there's this splash effect. Um, probably the sunlight coming in somewhere, probably mold on the lens somewhere, uh, but totally, totally cool. Um, then this is me. Who knows why I have like great detail on my hair, but then all this stuff is foggy all around. Don't know. Um, but as these cameras age, they, they get uh, peculiar in, in very interesting ways. And I think it's a lot of fun. Plus five bucks. Move a little more modern here and talk about the Polaroid. This is the Polaroid SX70. Uh, these are probably more of a familiar style to you uh, since um, since uh, slideshows and things skew more for interfaces like to show Polaroids as representing a photo. Uh, the SX70 is from the 70s and 80s. Um, again, another camera trying to democratize. Uh, although I, I do appear to select um, democratic cameras as well. Uh, they're, they're way easier to work with and they tend to hold up better. 70s and 80s, uh, this one is collapsible, collapses down to about the same size as the Kodak Pocket. Um, so pretty small, a little heft to it. Uh, but the fun thing about Polaroids is that they are instant. Uh, put that in quotes. Um, they do take a few minutes to process. Um, and they are seeing a modern resurgence. You've probably, you've probably at least seen a Polaroid camera in, in a store somewhere. Um, it's, it's a fascinating story to, to look up actually is that folks did revive the, the brand uh, and the, the film and it is now actually possible to buy a brand new Polaroid. Uh, but this one's antique, I enjoy the, the antique uh, and I enjoy just how messed up it is. Uh, they are not cheap, the film is not cheap uh, and especially when you consider that you only get one shot at the photo. You can't take like 12 without using up the whole whole pack of film. It can be a little expensive. Um, and one of the cool things though that I would encourage you uh, if you're gonna do some Polaroids is mess with, mess with the photo while it's developing. Um, there are all sorts of people who, who just make whole, whole forms of art by taking a Polaroid of something and then taking a spoon and mashing the film while it's developing. Uh, and it, it makes swirls and, and uh, it's, it's really a lot of fun. Um, there are other things you can do to it as well. Um, so if you do get into Polaroids, that's, that's my encourage, encouragement to you. And here are the sorts of photos that I got. And as you can see, they're kind of, kind of blown out. Middle one's kind of blurry, it's at night. Um, I think the camera collected light for probably about five minutes to get that shot. Um, and then in broad daylight, it doesn't know what to do with the light. It gets completely sunburned. Uh, and you end up with this, but, but I, I love the, uh, I love the look that it, that it gives to things. The, uh, like you really do see a lot of Polaroids of, of people having a good time laughing. Um, and then I also like this one on the right because it kind of feels like a Clint Eastwood thing. Um, I, this actually was in Bokeh, so I'm sure they've, they filmed the Westerns there. And then have fun. Um, there are some really cool old cameras out there. And because, because film photography is really being abandoned, means you can get some really good deals on stuff. Um, they, the film still exists for, for many of these cameras. Um, and you could just have so much fun. This, this one upper middle here, this is a Viewmaster camera. Um, if you've ever seen a Viewmaster, it's, it's the 3D where you, you click, it's the red binocular looking things where you click and you get a 3D image. This actually takes 3D photos that can be used in a Viewmaster. 
really, really fun camera. Um, here's little baby Max, teeny little camera. You feel like a spy. Uh, they don't make the film for this anymore. Uh, so if you're if you're okay hacking, um, which I am, get ready to hack on this one because you will be pulling apart a spool of film in complete darkness, taking scissors, trying to slice it, <laughs> uh, and then roll it up and jam it into the camera and close the camera in complete darkness uh, so that nothing gets exposed. Uh, then you'll have to figure out what to do after that. Uh, then this guy over here on the right, this, this beauty is a Russian 3D camera, uh, Cold War technology, uh, Sputnik, is what it what it says up there um, and cold war cameras are really interesting because the us and the ussr were were really trying to show each other up and so there's such interesting technology happening um, you look at the viewmaster camera this thing is it's american technology it wants to get noticed uh, for being pretty the sputnik does its job really well and in a really intelligent way. Um, so these two lenses, in fact, if you take a look down here, there's this little crossbar. What's going on is as you focus, the crossbar and this gear in the middle are making sure that both of the lenses have the same opening and the same focus. Uh, and it just works. The thing just works. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's also built like a tank. So you can drop a Sputnik and not worry. If you drop a Viewmaster, you're probably going to worry a little bit. It's pretty tough, but uh, still very interesting differences going on there. You can really see sort of a anthropology uh, through through these antique cameras. Here's how you can get started. Um, number one is go down to a flea market, five bucks. Um, don't be afraid to bargain. Um, you can get some piece of junk that still works. Uh, and if you're just starting out, a $5 brownie Bakelite box with no adjusting things, you tape it up with some gaffer's tape, try it out and see if you like it. And you're not set back all that far, uh, just a couple of bucks. Um, for film, these are the three sizes that are easiest to work with. Um, and most of the cameras out there are gonna use something like 120. Uh, the, the the old ones that I'm looking at are 127. You can find these at your your usual photo stores or online uh, photo stores. They'll have these. And then 35 millimeter, um, which is really what the the end of the 1900s. Uh, really, a lot of cameras, a lot of consumer cameras were using 35 millimeter. That stuff is out there. Um, if you go and you buy, buy like those disposable cameras, that's got 35 millimeter film in it. Uh, very, very easy to find. Of the three, 35 millimeter is the easiest to use uh, because it comes in a cartridge. It's self-contained. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're, if you're worried about dealing with the film, fumbling it and keeping it away from light, 35 millimeter is the way I go. Um, I found mine at a, a swap meet. So flea market swap meets, totally way to go. Um, they probably are going to think that you're just a hipster buying it for your Zoom room. Um, and if things don't work out with the camera, you can turn it into a hipster Zoom room. Um, eBay. eBay also has a lot of these. Um, watch out for speculative bubbles. Uh, for instance, my Kodak Vest Pocket, uh, it's one of my favorites uh, that I told you was like 20 bucks or something. Um, it was. Uh, but then eBay has this way of getting bubbles where the last time I checked to see what a Kodak Best Pocket was, somebody wanted 250 or best offer. And I offered like 200 and they basically told me I was being a complete jerk. Um, you know, the market will pay or people will speculate. Um, the thing was worth 20 bucks. So there will be cycles where you're, you're getting the brownie, the Bakelite box of doom uh, real cheap one month. And then you're getting the best pocket real cheap the next month. Um, so watch out for those. Do a little bit of research there. Uh, you will find these at estate sales. Um, probably it's been sitting around in somebody's attic. 
uh, probably has mold, probably has a crack or two, but uh, I mean, who cares? Uh, and some of these you can practically throw in a dishwasher. So check out estate sales if you're into that kind of thing. Um, or better yet is not wait until there's an estate sale to go ask your relatives. Um, grandparents, parents even, uh, may just have these lying around. Uh, especially once you get the word out there or once you've got one or two already, your relatives are going to find out and they're going to be like, oh yeah, we got this thing. We had no idea what to do with it. Um, so you can get plenty of these for free just by letting people know that you're looking for them. Um, they don't, they don't want them, but they don't want to throw them out. Uh, so it's, it's kind of fun for them to get, get a little extra life. I don't know. As you go, take notes. Uh, these cameras are not an exact science. Um, you can have an app on your phone that tells you exactly what film speed and lens opening and exposure time to use, uh, which is really great uh, if you've gone out and purchased a really expensive SLR or something. Not terribly useful if you've got the Kodak Pocket camera, where your two choices are an exposure time of a 25th of a second or a 50th of a second. That's your choice. That's all you got. Um, you can hold it open for a few seconds if you like, but that's pretty much it. Uh, aperture size, how how wide open the, the light opening is. A lot of times you don't, there's no number on there. Um, and so the apps are gonna be really interesting um, and they'll give you a little bit of guidance, but what you're gonna wanna do is take notes. And just say, hey, for instance, I've got this new Kodak Best Pocket. I've used 400 speed film. That'll be right on the, the film canister itself. Um, and then I'm just gonna take really quick notes on what I was shooting so that when I get the film back from processing, I can remind myself which frame it was, what type of light it was, um, how my uh, how wide my aperture was, how much light I was letting in, and then how long the shutter was open for. Uh, these can be approximations because these old cameras, they don't give you all these numbers to work with. They're not on a fancy SLR. So you're just going to have to write down something like, hey, the aperture was wide open, it was in the daylight, and I used the 25th. Uh, um, the other thing that I've that I found is, is useful is even if you don't want to take notes, you could at least pull out um, your, your app on your phone and just screenshot it. That's actually exactly what this is, is a screenshot um, from when I was trying out a new camera. And so all in here, I can tell pretty much the same stuff um, is the speed of my film, um, roughly how wide the lens could have been, uh, what exposure was recommended, and so at least it's kind of a proxy for, this is how quickly I should have done this. Here's how much light uh, the app was seeing. So that uh, if you don't wanna take notes, that's a way to kind of take notes is to say, wow, this exposure time was really, really small. That means it was really, really bright. That was a daylight shot. And just have fun uh, with both of these things, um, RFID tags and, Antique cameras are just, it's just a lot of fun. It's its a, a thing that you've only seen from the outside maybe and you weren't sure if you could like actually get in there and, and try copying a key tag or or, or using that, that camera that, that, you know, grandpa had, um, you really can. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy and you can go a pretty cheap route, see if you like it um, or solve the problem at hand. Um, and if you don't like it, you don't, if you do, now you got some more fun stuff to do. So that's, this actually is an anaglyph from uh, combining a Sputnik photo. It takes two photos at a time. And then there are apps out there that'll turn two photos into a, a red, red, blue 3D image. So that's what this guy is. I was just having fun. Um, and that's my talk. I'm Gabe Schuyler. Uh, if you're on the hell site with the blue bird, Gabe Sky, you can follow me. Uh, I'll be in the Slack on, on this track, on the track one, uh, answer questions happily, um, or DM me, that's, that's open too. Hi, Gabe, that was an awesome presentation. Um, my question is, which camera is your favorite? 
<laughs> oh, that's a tricky one, but it has to be, oh man. Favorite, favorite is the vest pocket because it's small and it's collapsible. And like, you feel like some sort of old tiny person when you're like, you're like, oh, I'm going to take your picture, you know, to your friend. And then you're like, take. <laughs> So that's, like, that's what did you really do? Cool. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like you feel like you should have one of those flash bulbs and, and a cigar hanging out of your mouth. And so for the little tiny mini, how huh? big was the film? What I had to do was take a 35 millimeter uh, film, uh, which is probably about as wide as like your AirPod case um, and go into complete darkness um, and cut it in half down the, the whole length um, and then just like kind of wound it up stuffed it in there um, and luckily the the machines that they process this film on don't care how wide it is uh, so they just it's the same process of like clip it in feed it into the machine and that it, it actually worked that's super cool okay um let's see if we have other questions I really like, I didn't know that you could, I mean, it makes sense, but I didn't know that you could take like a spoon to a Polaroid and, and make things happen. That's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. You got to try it if you've got a Polaroid. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but it seems as though like the older Polaroids, if you can get the, the film that fits, it's, they seem to be work, or they seem to work better than the new ones. <laughs> Huh. huh. I haven't actually tried any one in a while. I just yeah. had the junky old one. Yeah. Which which is also fun in the same way as the vest pocket because it's also collapsible. So you're like, hey, you want a Polaroid of you? And your friend's like, yeah, sure. And you're like, okay, click, right? click. It's so clunky. It's fun. Lots of comments about like the brownie and people, you know, being like, that's my era of the... Yes. <laughs> the Russian, the Russian camera was super cool. Oh, I love that thing. It's it's brilliant, and it's similar to the, uh, which now I understand is not true, but it's similar to like the, how people say like, the U.S. invented the space pen, you know, with like tons of engineering, and the Russians right. just used a pencil, um, which I, I think is now urban legend. But it's still it's the same thing. It's like we had the Viewmaster, and it's like amazing engineering, and they're like, yeah, but this works too. Do you have like a um, a recommended place that you would send your stuff to if somebody doesn't have like the setup to develop some of these things at home? Um, or film? These days I don't. Uh, there are there are labs out there, um, and actually, if you if there is a photography shop in your in your city or whatever, um, just go talk to them. They can, they will send it out to a lab that that knows how to work with it. Okay. Um, and then somebody else asked uh, if the RFID is affected by interference at all. Um, I haven't had trouble with it, but it's uh, it's so close. The the reader and the, the tag are, are close enough and it's low tech enough that I haven't really had trouble. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Gabe. This was a great presentation. Yeah.